Hi, REI rookies. We have a great guest on the program today. His name is Jack Bosch, known as the land guy. So we're going to talk to Jack about investing in land, flipping land. Uh, he's been doing that for a while and also about how he diversifies uh, his portfolio with other types of investments. But uh, we love to focus on his specific topic, which is purchasing and flipping land. So welcome to the show, Jack Bosch. How are you doing today? I'm doing excellent. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, we were just talking about, uh, you pronounced my last name right, which is Koth, which is a good German stock. And uh, you, you came over from Germany. Uh, what year was that? And tell, tell me a little bit about your journey and what led you to America. Yeah, what led me, I'm, yes, I'm from Germany. What led me to America was really, um, I wanted to finish a college degree. I was working, I was, I was in college in Germany and I was working part-time at like a software firm, even though I'm not a software guy. I was more like in the business, but as a college student, I started out literally copying papers and they created their own software. I was a tester and I had no computer, computer skills. So I would just hit everywhere and the stuff would crash <laughs> and I would document it. Right. And they, and they, they would, they would sometimes scratch their head and it's like, well, how in the world did you get it to crash? And it's like, <laughs> well, uh, why would ever would you click there? But anyway, bottom line is I worked my way up in that firm and I had a job offer from them for when I was finishing college and I had about one year to go. And I realized, though, they were expanding internationally. They had people from, from the U.S. there and they had people from India there and the language was starting to change to English. And I realized my English was horrible mm -hmm. at the time. I, was good. I understood everything or most of it, but I could really not communicate as well as I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And so or perhaps it wasn't horrible, but it was bad. It was, I, I realized I had this ambition to become, to make a career in business in kind of corporate Germany or corporate America, basically, or corporate Germany in that case. And, and I realized I needed to speak better English. So I, I found a university, a college that was a partner college with my college over there. Uh, and I applied for a one-year exchange program where I could go there uh, for and, and actually get an American degree and then get credit for the German classes that were still missing. So basically mm -hmm. beat two birds in one bush, right? Mm -hmm. uh, beat, uh, and beat two things, do, do, do two things in one, in one swoop, which is mm -hmm. finish my German degree, get an American MBA and, uh, and learn English, right? Uh, like improve my English. They're so like, perfect. Let's do that. Never been to the U S I put my stuff into my parents' basement and, uh, said like, see you in 10 months. And off I went, uh, and, uh, well, three weeks later, I met the girl that is the love of my life that I now married to 17 years. Wow. And um, she was also finishing her degree. What part of the country were you in? Uh, Illinois. Oh, okay. Like really? in a, there's just normal kind of university, Western Illinois University, just happened yep. to have an exchange program somewhere in the middle of nowhere. And, um, and she was there. She's not from here either. She's from Honduras, Central America. Oh, wow. So we both decided to stay here if we could. We both managed to get a job, get the work visa, get that process down there. But over a few years, we realized that, uh, that this job thing wasn't what, what it was made out to be. And right. uh, we hated my job, hated what I was doing, didn't enjoy being traveling all the time. And, and that started that thought process of like, I got to find some other way and mm -hmm. it's not going to be a job. I got to stand on my own two feet, even though I never thought I would. That was not in my career plans. Mm -hmm. But I, I was almost forced into it, and and I'm I'm glad I did. I could I, because I consider myself unemployable now. <laughs> That's awesome. So I was going to ask you, you know, since you're in the unique position of growing up in another country, um, you know, I've obviously been through the public education system here, and really, you come out really unprepared for the business world. I mean, you barely even learn how to balance a checkbook here in public schools in America. Um, how are the German? education system is it comparable like or do they give you any it's spark of entrepreneurship thing. or is it pretty much the same thing it's the same thing i think it's a possibly even worse in the sense mm -hmm. that uh at least in the u.s there's a big focus on teamwork mm -hmm. and on independent projects and things like that versus germany it's just like uh memorizing learning things at least back in the days it was like that i mean mm -hmm. obviously i'm out of school now for over 30 well so I'm here in the country 22 years ago okay. now. So it's, but, but back then, and from, I understand how it still is. It's like, it's, I went to a good public school um, and probably happened to be one of the best in the state, I think back then. And in a small town, just the only, the only high school you can go to, right. There isn't really mm -hmm. a choice. And I mean, I got a really good academic 
upbringing that helped me go to college and things like that. But in terms of entrepreneurship, not even college, this was a class that was offered. Um, there was no, no, nothing, zero. <laughs> so what, what, and I realized it was kind of a disdain and a dislike for your employment situation that kind of sparked your, your need to branch out and, and discover being an entrepreneur. Can you point to some materials? Cause if it was maybe 20, 20 ish years ago, uh, what type of materials did you consume? Like I know when, when I read rich dad, poor dad, you know, that sparked yeah. it for me. Was it books like that or what gave you the idea of being an entrepreneur and investor or even investing in any type of real estate at all? How did you lead down that path? Yeah, it was actually a combination of Richard Poor Dad and, 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 and an infomercial by Ron Legrand back in the okay. days. That I didn't buy his program, but I just like the fact that this thing kept popping up and, and that there's people waving checks. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and I was like, really? You can make $15,000 or $25,000 in one deal? I mean, that's like half my salary or so. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, more than half my salary. So I was like, that's, let me look into that. And then as a coincidence, my wife then actually, she won, she continued, she worked also for a year and then she, she re-entered school to get a master's. And, uh, and, and in that school, Robert Kiyosaki ended up being in Phoenix where Robert Kiyosaki lives. Robert Kiyosaki back then in 1999, the book was just coming out. Nobody mm -hmm. had read it. Yet. Not many people had read it yet. He hired a few students from that school to help him with his marketing plan. Oh, wow. And, uh, and one of that students was in a, in a studying group with my wife. So we were over at dinner to, uh, or a little party or so over at this guy's house one time. And he tells me like, hey, I read this book. I met this guy. Go read this book. And I, read, and I took it home and I literally devoured it in like 18 hours. I had finished that book. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I couldn't, just couldn't stop reading it. And, that, and that's like, oh, my God, there's something more to this. Mm -hmm. And then we didn't buy, we, we back then, we didn't even know there were courses around. We, didn't, we weren't in that part of thing. We didn't know about seminars and things like that or, or, or yeah, home study courses. We, we, just, uh, we, just, we just went to the library, went to Barnes & Nobles and took a real estate book and while drinking a coffee, starting reading through it and, and at least understanding the base philosophy of it because in the base, right. the base language for that matter because mm -hmm. coming from another country, like even words like deed, I didn't know what that meant. Title, closing, yeah. uh, right. I didn't know what that meant. Like, uh, like shingles, like composite shingles. What is a composite shingle? I, I have no idea, right? So, <laughs> right. so th there's lots of language that you have to learn first before you even understand what people are talking about in this world. You said to learn the jargon. Yeah, no, that's one thing I was going to ask about too. In Germany versus America, is real estate investing a thing in Germany? Can you purchase and own a house as a landlord, as an investor? It's becoming a thing. Like okay. real estate has, uh, uh, Germany has been on about a 10 year uh, real estate or 10 or 12 year real estate boom. Mm -hmm. The prices have been going up. Every Basically, when the U.S. started struggling in real estate and the big recession happened and the European Union, a couple of countries started getting into trouble. The Germans started looking around and started saying, OK, where's the safest place I can put my money? And a lot of them started putting it in real estate. Right. And because a lot of countries that are in crisis now, Germany wasn't in crisis, but the European Union was a little bit. So mm -hmm. uh, so ever since then, there's become like more and more popular to invest in real estate over there. And I now actually have quite a few friends over there that I've met in the meantime that, and I'm, I'm invited to speak over there. So I'm going, I'm just talking about land flipping versus house right. flipping. Mm -hmm. but I'm going in September, I'm going out there to speak in front of like 1200 people about the concept of land flipping in the U S and, awesome. but yes, there's more and more people. The only thing it's there that they're, that they're not, the privacy rules are completely different. So you can't do what we do with direct mail and things like that. Oh, okay. you, have to, uh, you have to literally just go find off-market deals by broker relationships and things like that. Or, um, and, and, but there's, and then buy like one condo at a time because usually okay. you don't buy, most of the cities are, are, are all full of condos, very few big apartment complexes, very few of those things. So I know a bunch of people that buy like 10, 15, 20, individual or 10 to 15 individual condos per year and that cash flow like if they're excited though if that thing cash flows at 50 bucks a month 50 100 oh, wow. a month it's That's, a very slow process right uh of uh, of, of building wealth over there mm -hmm. but nevertheless over the next 30 years these things are still being paid off so it's a long it's a more wealth oriented focus than a quick flip oriented focus building net worth rather than cash flow yes 
or right. net wealth with a little cash flow, but instead of versus in the US, it's a very income oriented process right. uh, where people just think about flipping. Yep. And flipping can be done like you make 10, 15, 20 grand very quickly mm -hmm. and you do that again and again. And I actually, I do both because flipping is great for cash, mm -hmm. but if you ever stop, you have nothing to fall back on. Right. So you need the cash flow, you need the wealth generation aspect of the business in order to be really, truly what I call generationally wealthy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's talk about, so you kind of went down your journey, you read Rich Dad Poor Dad, had the spark of entrepreneurship, wanting to be certifiably unemployable, and you knew real estate was the, was the key. Um, so tell me a little about your journey and how you found this niche of land. It's very interesting to me because, you know, we, obviously we invest in single families, small multis around here, and everybody understands that. You know, you buy a house, somebody lives in it, they pay you rent. Uh, it's very, you know, easy to grasp. So tell me about how land is different, what led you to land and why you prefer it as, as a vehicle to right. regular single family real estate. I, I prefer it because I always say land is better than houses. Now, not to bash houses because I, I now own almost 50 rental houses. I own 340 units in apartment complex. When I say I, I basically, I mean my wife and I, my team and I, uh, like mainly my wife and I, we own this together as a business partner. She's integral part of the business and, yeah. and so on. But, uh, but land, we stumbled into land. Like the first deal we wanted to do was a wholesale deal of a triplex. And we did everything wrong you could do wrong because we did not know anything. We didn't understand how much it cost to repair a roof or replace a room, replace a, uh, replace a kitchen, re fix a foundation, get rid of mold, uh, window replacements, all this kind of stuff I had not the first idea of. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, I didn't even know what to expect for a fair price to be. And, and I was like the perfect candidate to be ripped off by the contract. <laughs> right. And, and luckily we backed out of that deal after nobody wanted to buy it. And now I understand this thing was a complete teardown. Right. Like there is not, it wasn't even worth it, uh, worth even putting a dollar into that. Just tear it down, rebuild something. So, but then we started figuring out that, that people that there's, we came across the tax lien and tax deed concept. Mm -hmm. And the concept that people didn't pay their property taxes just blew us away. Why in the world would somebody not pay their property taxes? To make a long story short, we, we tried that and we failed there. We attended tax lien auctions, bought liens, and we, they were three weeks later, they were redeemed, and we got our money back plus like $3 in interest. <laughs> and, and then we attended the tax deed auction where they sell the actual property, and, and we were outbid right away, and, uh, and, and Michelle went there, um, and, and she was outbid. She got all the money we had, which was only 3500 bucks at the time, and, and very quickly, there's three lots that were listed at $1,000 minimum per bid. We was like, we're going to get one of them. They sold for $15,000 each. And, oh, wow. But what we realized at the end of the day was that the fact that there's somebody not paying property taxes means that there's people not wanting their properties anymore. They're literally willing to walk away from them and get nothing for them. Mm -hmm. So one day we had this epiphany. We said, like, why don't we just try to contact them directly? So we got yeah. their names. We got their mailing addresses. We sent them a letter. And, and we got some responses back. And none of that worked into a deal right away because we approached it all wrong but we found something that we could see, hey, there's responses. It means this, is, this can work. So we tweaked it, tweaked it. And then one day we got it right. We sent out 400 letters and we got about, uh, I think, 20 responses on that. And, uh, and one of them was a guy that had, a, and, and, and here's the thing, out of these 20 responses, 20 were in land properties. Wow. We're just like, we're just like okay, it's like everyone wants to sell us their land. So let's look at it. But because we were careful at that moment, we didn't know what we can do. We made very, very low offers. Mm -hmm. We ended up making an offer for $400 on a property we thought was worth $8,000. And we got it accepted. And we literally, the day we closed on it, we sold it to the neighbor for, for $4,000. Oh, so you knew there was something there. Yeah, that's, that's And we were great. like, okay, there's something there. And then, yep. and, then, and then the next deal we made $10,000 on. And the next deal we made $6,000 on. Then we bought a portfolio shortly after of 20 properties for $3,000. And... And we're like, okay, this is like, and, and we sold with the like, and, and soon enough we realized that this really works and we stopped focusing on houses altogether because we realized, hey, with land, we don't have to know anything about houses, right? We don't <laughs> have to deal with- repair a roof, yeah, okay. none of that. Yeah, we don't have to deal with roof repairs, with foundation repairs, with mold, with uh, kitchen repairs, with, with assessment. We don't even have to get into the property. 
Soon enough, we realized we can do this from a distance with Google Earth and Google, uh, Google Maps. Wow. And so for the last 11 years, I haven't been looking at any single one of our properties. Wow. And nobody, isn't, nobody in our team has because you don't have to get a key to get in. You, don't, mm -hmm. you can see everything on there. And we also realized that 90% or eight, over 80% of our deals were done by people who don't even owe property taxes. So the tax delinquent side is where mm -hmm. we got into the deals, but now we don't even focus on tax delinquents anymore. I was going to say that the first 400 people that you mailed to, that, those were people that had were behind on their yeah. taxes initially. And uh, you realize that that doesn't necessarily have to be a factor. So no. So now tell me, when you're looking for these deals, how do you determine uh, someone's likely to want to sell? Or are you just blasting everyone and hoping for a certain response? So we look at, we look at the, the criteria. Like, for example, we look at the, uh, the value of the properties. We found that our sweet spot is properties that are worth anywhere between ten and $100,000. Okay. So we eliminate everything else out of it. Sometimes we go a little lower, depend on the area. We might include the ones that are only worth like five grand. But... If the property's worth five grand, you have to literally make a $200 offer in order to make sense on it, to make right. any kind of decent money on it. Yep. At a $10,000 property, I can offer $1,000, $1,500, sell it for seven and make a $6,000 spread or $5,000 spread. Like that's kind of a small wholesale deal in the housing world. Yeah, and the return and, on that is is crazy. Just the Yeah, the return is crazy, exactly. Yeah. But the cash thing is still similar to a house, just without the hassles. Right. So it just, and that's why I say uh, it's better in houses because you don't have to deal with any of that. You can do almost everything with that. You can split them. You can, uh, you can rezone them. You can split them. You can sell it with seller financing. You can sell it with, uh, for wholesale. You can wholesale them. You can retail them. Uh, you can build something on them. You can, you can, anything you want to do. Right? So and, now let, me, let me ask you as a, as a, you know, somebody who's completely unknowledgeable about this, this niche, what uh, typically is, are this, is the land being used for? Like you, you just said you can use it for almost anything, but is it the bulk of the, of the parcels that you're selling uh, or buying or you're involved with, is it like recreational type or is it like for people to build a house on eventually? What would so we say? focus on three kinds of properties and most of them, they are completely unused when we buy them and they continue to be unused because people just like the idea of owning them okay. more than anything. Okay. So we own three, three kinds of properties. Number one, it's infill lots. Infill lots are very, very you, you usually don't buy those for five cents on a dollar. You have to borrow for more like 30 to 50 cents on a dollar, mm -hmm. but you can instantly sell them to a builder. Like infill lots are hot. The millennials want to be in the inside uh, of, the, of the, the cities. They want to use their bicycle, go to the coffee shops and so on. So yeah. anything infill lot go, flies off the shelves as soon as you can get it. Mm -hmm. Second property is actually the outskirts of town. So if you have a city, a big city, like a million people, and you're right on the outskirts in the path of growth, right. cities are continuous to growing. Atlanta, Denver, uh, Dal Dallas, uh, Phoenix, LA, Miami, I mean, Char Char Charlotte, Raleigh, I mean, they're all growing, right? right? Wherever you are, the big cities in the US, they're growing. Um, and if you're just outside of it, you're attractive to, your, your property size is usually gonna be between one and 10 acres. Mm -hmm. And you're really attractive for two kinds of buyers. You're attractive for the, for the financial investor, that takes money off the, from the stock market right now and puts it in something like this. Because if the city is approaching, in five to 10 years from now, the city is all around that lot, that they can buy that lot from you for $30,000 today and you bought it for five, yeah. right? You flip it to them for 30, make a nice $25,000 profit and they hold on to it for 10 years. Now it's surrounded by the city. This thing is worth $300,000. Wow. So that's a very smart move for a lot of people. They have cash. And they just put some in the stock market, some into this. Second person is attractive for is people that want to live, uh, that want to live in a more affordable lifestyle. They mm -hmm. can't afford to buy a three hundred thousand, four hundred thousand dollar house in the city, so they're buying a thirty thousand dollar lot, putting a mobile home on it or a small house on it over mm -hmm. time, retiring there, but they're ten, twenty minutes away from the doctor, the grocery stores, the movies. And they have kind of have their own privacy, their own little. And they have an acre, a couple of acres. They have some space for some animals and things like that, and they like that. Okay. Third kind of properties we're focusing on is on the large acreage in the recreational areas. So, but still with something to show off. Like if you live in Atlanta, a lot of people in Atlanta would love to, buy, to, to take a two-hour drive in, in, on the weekend and go up into the mountains and have a beautiful 10-acre property there that they can horse around, they can go shooting, they can go uh, ATVing, they can do hiking, they can have fun like that. 
Okay, so, so it's kind of like their own little piece of national park, kind of. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> exactly. As long as you focus on these kind of lots, these kind of properties, you have a ready-made buyer pool of millions of buyers ready to buy these properties. Awesome. So then I love what you said too about you not visiting the properties. So really you can do, and where do you live now? Is it Phoenix, you said? Or? I live in Phoenix, Arizona. Yeah. Phoenix, okay, cool. So uh, where typically, uh, what areas of the country are your markets that are the hottest that you sell in? Wherever there's land, uh, but <laughs> no, I mean, there's, a, there's something to be, the nice part about it is, is that a lot of our students, we teach this now, uh, have uh, courses and stuff about it, but a lot of our students, um, it doesn't matter where they live, they understand that this is a truly virtual program. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, because I'm from Germany, I'm starting to, like being, Germans have found out about this year, and they're reaching out to me to interview me in a couple of podcasts, and we have a steady stream of German students now that are doing this successfully from Germany That's in the really United fun. States without ever having come to the United States. There's a guy who's done 35 deals already. Wow. He has never been to the United States of America. Wow. So he's awesome. just flipping it from over there because he don't need to do He speak good English so he can list yeah. the properties on, on Facebook and Craigslist and those kind of places. Mm -hmm. He sells them just fine. He has another VA that helps him over here. But other than that, it's completely done remotely. So having said that, we have done deals from, Flo from Hawaii to Florida, from Indiana to Texas, and, uh, and, and all around. We've done deals in 17 states and over 100 different counties. And uh, our students are deals from Wisconsin to Florida and from, from upstate New York to, uh, to California. Wow. It really is, works anywhere. And if you feel like you are in an area where there's, if you live in Manhattan, okay, I'll give you that. There's probably not many deals in Manhattan. Right. But if you live in Manhattan, there's nothing that keeps you from doing deals in Texas if you want to. Right. Like we got a guy who lives in, North, uh, in, in New Hampshire. He does deals in New Hampshire. He does deals in Alaska. And he does deals in Florida. Have you tried right. North Dakota? That's where we live and there's nothing but land up here. <laughs> yeah, they're North Dakota. Uh, absolutely. North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana. There's quite a few students in Montana. It's yeah. uh, an interesting and, law for, uh, interesting and, and cool land and nice landscapes and and yeah, absolutely. North Dakota is great. Yeah, absolutely. So, so when you're uh, vetting these properties, like you said, you, or you're doing your due diligence, right? You're, and your, your system is kind of to make offers just kind of right out of the gate to see if there's interest. You just kind of make an offer. That, that's the first communication or what's your kind of bait or how you're reaching out to these potential sellers? Right. So we do a two-step system. I found the two-step system initially works way better than the blind offer right out of the get-go. Okay. Um, the blind offer has a problem. The main problem of it is that if you're dealing with a, uh, in an environment or in an area where every lot is a little bit different from the other one, you have to do this humongous amount of research up front before you can actually send out any blind offers. Gotcha. I'm not a big fan of that. Instead, what I do is we, we filter out the list of prices and then to your previous question, after like the five to a hundred thousand or ten to a hundred thousand dollar range, we filter it out. We like out of state owners first. We look at how long have they owned the property. We look at where they live. We look at we look at multiple criteria before we finalize our selection of the people that that we think don't want their property anymore. And that's mm -hmm. the key. We're not stealing properties from grandma. We're right. buying properties that the owners just are about to stop paying property taxes, or in some cases, they've stopped paying property taxes. 80% of our deals, they still pay property taxes, but they're praying every night that they should, could just somebody come along and take that property burden off their shoulders. Because the one thing that differs land from houses is in land, there, while you hold on to it, there's no income. Mm hmm and but there's actually an expense and the expense is the property taxes so these people right. are sick and tired of not using the land their dad having bought it they inherited it they've owned it for 30 40 years in the family uh and they're just paying money every every year and they never go out to see it so they're hoping that somebody like that comes along so it's what we do is nothing positive for them either exactly it's not doing nothing doing anything positive for them so they're so we're doing with what we're doing is a two-step approach we send them a friendly letter first, a letter that we've tweaked over 4,000 deals that we've done. We've done over there, 40, going on 4,100 deals. And, um, and every single one, of, and we've tested these letters uh, a million times and probably almost really a million times or several hundred thousand <laughs> times as we send right. them out. Right. And, and we're sending them out uh, and they've proven to be the most response letter that we've ever sent out. So once mm -hmm. we got that right, 
send out this letter, and then we're getting about a 5 to 15% response rate from the sellers. Well, wow, that's pretty high compared to normal direct mail for houses. Exactly, right. because we're dealing in a non-competition area. Right. Right? We're dealing in an area where there's nobody else or very few people are, are, other than us are sending out letters. Yes, we've told it to a few people, but there's 3,007 counties. Like even if there's 3,007 full-time real estate flipper, or land flippers in the U.S., which there's not, there's probably 300 by now, there would still be, every, there would still be only one county for every investor. Mm-hmm. Now, if you compare that to the housing world, how many house flippers are there in every major market? Oh, yeah. Like, a there's <laughs> 1,000 for every major market, 2,000, 3,000. Phoenix, wherever you live, there's probably at least 2,000 full-time house flippers on that one market. But there's mm-hmm. probably only a handful of land flippers. Mm-hmm. So there's really we're in a non-competition area. So we get a huge response rate and then we turn around and we, and we then, but then the response rate, even if the response rate is 10%, if we send out a thousand letters, we get a hundred phone calls. Mm-hmm. So that now what that means is that we need to do the research on what these properties are worth only on 100, not on 1000. Right. So really one, maximizing your efforts and being efficient. Exactly. On 1,000, we would have to spend a full month all day long doing raw property research. Mm-hmm. On 100, you can do it in a, in a day. So when you do your due diligence and you're deciding if it's a property you actually want to purchase and what is a fair or what a profitable offer for you, give me a breakdown uh, quickly of how, what kind of criteria you guys use uh, to do so, that. You said you use so Google Earth and, and... At this point, the goal is is to just get a ballpark value of the property value of the property. So like the ARV in a house, like what, what you could sell it for. But we don't have to be as, a, as correct, as accurate as an ARV. Mm-hmm. Because in our world, we are, we're going to offer, our, in our world, we're offering the maximum you offer is 25 cents on a dollar. Okay. Except if it's an infill lot, then you can go higher. But outside of that, in the outskirts of town, the rural areas, we offer between five and 25 cents on the dollar. So that means that if we are 20, 30% off in our market analysis on the value, we're still going to make a profit. Mm-hmm. So we don't have to be as accurate because it's if you're in very the house, conservative. If you, yeah, if you have an ARF of $200,000 and you have 20%, it destroys your deal. Mm-hmm. Right? Or it makes your deal, either way. Right? Yeah, right. But, uh, but if, you, if you're off the wrong direction, you just lost $20,000 in the worst case. Right. In our scenario, if you think something is worth $20,000 and we make a $3,500 offer on that thing and we realize it's only worth $16,000, we're still going to make a profit on that deal. We're still going to make like 10 grand on this deal. Yeah, you're still way, way safe. Exactly. Very conservative, so yeah. Based on that, we don't have to spend a lot of time on that, on that uh, on the ballpark research. What we do is we could look at comps. We look at comps first, sold comps. We look at assessed value. We look at, if no, uh, we look at the sizes that are available. And then kind of like if there's a 10 acre for, for sale or several 10 acres that have sold and yours is five, well, you can mm-hmm. kind of adjust for size a little bit right. if, uh, and, and, and those kind of things. So we, get, we have like a total of five different ways to get to the value. You don't always use all five. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you're done with one. Sometimes in, in like three minutes, we're done with one. There's five comparable solds. That are all five acres. They're all sold for forty to forty-five thousand dollars. We're done. Value right. forty thousand dollars. Move on so, to the next deal. So let me oh, ask you this. Oh, uh, go ahead. No, sorry, not to interrupt. But you're so you're you're offering twenty twenty-five cents on the dollar now in the you know the single-family world. Uh, you, none of those would probably get accepted. I mean, we're we're usually shooting in the forty to sixty percent range. Uh, so uh-huh. so. And now, obviously, you know, you, you've kind of worked your list out and you've tweaked your letter. So your people are kind of self-selecting as they have the level of motivation. So tell me about getting a 25 cents on the dollar offer accepted versus in the, the housing yeah. world where so, that yeah. would never fly. On average, on average, we and our students get anywhere between a, a deal accepted for every 20 to 35 offers we make. That's not bad, though. No, it's not bad at all. That's, that's, so made, I, I'd love that in the housing world too. Right, absolutely. And then there's ways that you can actually get more of them accepted. So in some cases, by doing some follow-up. Mm-hmm. Right? But that's the first wave of offers. You send out those 100 offers, and on average, there's anywhere between two and uh, some, between two or three and, and four deals included in that. Now, that always doesn't, it depends on what value range you go in there. If you go after the $100,000 properties, you might have to make 100 offers to get a deal accepted. Right. But then you make 40 grand on that deal. Mm-hmm. Right? And on the $5,000 properties, the most we've ever done is we send out literally, I mean, that's an exceptional case, mm-hmm. but we send out 100 letters 
we got 55 phone calls and we bought 35 properties. <laughs> wow. Now that was an exception. Yeah. But the, 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 the average is somewhere in the middle and it depends on a little bit on area. It depends on price range and how desirable is the market and so on and so forth. But then you, but it's, that's what I'm saying, 20 to 35, 50 is the high end, but, uh, but that's what you get. But then you can do follow-ups. We do sometimes follow-ups by phone. We do follow-ups by second wave of, let, of offers and so on and so forth. And then wow. only after we've gotten those deals, once we're really familiar with a neighborhood, that's when you can switch over to the blind offers because now you know what the properties are worth in the neighborhood already. Yeah, you so can your already research target time is cut yeah. down. Mm -hmm. Great. So this is uh, very intriguing. So <laughs> it's pretty interesting. Now you were talking about, you, you said you flip and then obviously that generates income, but you can't stop because it's, you have to stay on that hamster wheel, right? So you've discovered right. as a diversification strategy, you, you have purchased you know, some other tra more traditional real estate type investments, right? As a way to kind of a buy and hold longer term. Yeah. So, strategy. Uh, our, go ahead. No. Oh yeah. So that, just tell me about that. And obviously, you know, you don't hate uh, the single family or the yeah. you know, multifamily world as a place to stick your money from a buy and hold perspective. Right. Now, cause uh, there really is no way to hold land. I suppose you almost have to flip it. Is that, am I correct? In right. That? There is ways to hold land if they're truly in the path of growth. So we have 12 properties that we own five acres each that we bought on average for about $4,000 a piece. Uh, that is right in the path of growth, just south of it, Microsoft, like the Bill Gates control company bought 20,000 acres. They're gonna put the smart city there. Just below that, another big development company owns 80,000 acres where they're already broken ground on what will, an uh, area that will house 300,000 people as the Phoenix area grows. We're right on the upper edge of that. So it's only uh, going to be a matter of another, let's say 10 years and these $4,000 properties are going to be worth in the vicinity of 150 to 300,000 dollars. Okay. That well. is an act. This is a nice kind of. We have 12 of them. We hold on to them. We will not sell them. We we'll just keep them. This is my retire. My additional kind of retirement <laughs> nest egg. Just 20 you know, years from now, when gonna, I'm in my 60s, yeah. those are going to pop at some point. Yeah, they're going to pop, and uh, exactly, they already doubled in value last year. And um, because as this news come up and people start mm -hmm. coming up and gobbling up stuff in the area. Uh, they already doubled in value. Now they're worth probably like about twenty thousand dollars a piece, and uh, and twenty twenty five thousand, and they'll continue going up there. And at some point of time, when I'm in my sixties, they'll be worth probably quarter million dollars each, and I'm sitting on three million dollars worth of land. Well, that's right? awesome. So that's by the way, that's why I recommend our students to do too. If you buy in an area that you think is a growing area, you might not be able to afford right now to hold on to that. So flip them, but mm -hmm. then keep some. Keep some. If you truly believe in that area, flip eight, keep two. The profit from the eight is going to be way, en way enough to pay for the two and then have some tens of thousands of dollars of profit. So do that as a strategy. But the other way, so there's three ways that we have or two ways that we have made more, brought more long-term stability into our business. Mm -hmm. One is by actually selling these pieces of land with seller financing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now, uh, instead of like you buy a property worth thirty thousand dollars, you put it, you buy it for four thousand dollars, you sell it for thirty, and you sell it with a with a twenty percent down payment with a six thousand dollar down payment. You have more as a down payment than you actually paid for the property. So you're you have two thousand dollars in your pocket, and now you're getting five hundred dollars a month for the next eight years. Yeah, right. So that it's it's almost like we do that with houses all the time. Contracts for deed we call it in this area. Yeah. Sell we it use financing. contracts for deeds too. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, so you, use the, you use the exact same press method. Mm -hmm. The only difference is that you're outside of Dodd Frank, so you don't have to do the mortgage originators and all oh, this kind okay. of stuff right. because land is outside of Dodd Frank because it's not a dwelling. Okay, and uh, and also you get into IRS problems if you do a lot of seller financing because you're a dealer, mm -hmm. and you, there's an exception in the IRS statutes for land flipping that uh, exempts you from the dealer status. So you have tax benefit, you have a better way of, of being able to do these and not have to pay taxes on the full income right away. Instead, you pay taxes only as the money comes in. Oh, wow. So there's some really benefits, on, some very little known benefits on land flipping that even for the experienced investor might make it more attractive. So let me, let me ask you this. So how do, how do st uh, potential students reach out? You talk a little bit about your, your coaching and how you said you've trained some students around the area. I'm sure a lot of people as they realize they can do this from, from anywhere, uh, would be interested in this type of training. Uh, yeah. tell, tell me about your coaching and, and how that works. 
Sure, absolutely. Uh, just to answer the other question, thing, what we also we, I don't hide houses. Oh, sure. In order yep. <laughs> to get cash flow going, also we've taken profits. Then after realizing that even the land notes, they they only for for eight years they last. We've taken money from 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 profits from our land flipping and now started buying houses with them. Okay. Started in 2009 when the market was in shambles, started buying as many houses as we could. They doubled, tripled, quadrupled in value. We still own them. They provide cash flow. And now lately we also started taking some of our money and moving it into apartment complexes because it's a more hands-off uh, tool that you have control of cash flow and of appreciation. Mm -hmm. So it's a really great way to add additional income to your life but you got to make money first. And yep. so land flipping is our choice, is our, our cash machine, as we call it, mm -hmm. our tool to actually provide the profits. It's kind so of your version of wholesaling. That, yeah, exactly. And that's, and that's exactly the method that we teach our students. So in terms of what we have for students, we have a home study course. It's an online course, a complete course, walks people from A to Z. There's nothing missing in that piece uh, through. People can find out uh, on that online. If you don't mind, I can share a link yeah. or so. Uh, land profit generator is the program grand profit generator.com you can Perfect. find out some more information about that there we also have a facebook group that our students hang out and it's literally off the chart success like mm -hmm. there's really uh, in the last couple of weeks i mean the last year two years it's going on like that but literally in the last couple of weeks i've like I, like in the last five days i've gotten there's like six success stories from students coming in. Like almost every day there's somebody, I got my first deal, I sold my first deal, I, I got my first sale of financing. It's just like pop, 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 pop. Mm -hmm. it's, like, it's because there's so many little competition and it's, there's no red tape around it. It's so much easier to implement than many other methods. So they're, they're, students are greatly successful. There's a Facebook group. It's also called the Land Profit Generator Real Estate Group. So that's free for people to join just check it out because they don't have to believe me about it. Well, also the barrier to entry is so much lower yeah. because, you know, you can purchase a parcel for so much less than a typical house. Uh, so you can get started a lot easier too. And I love the idea that you said the Facebook group is everybody sharing their success. I mean, the, the power of the mastermind and, and seeing that it's possible is so powerful for people that are getting into something to believe that, you know, success is it possible. Is. It is. And that is actually, I think a big reason why our program is so successful is that Facebook group, because mm -hmm. in the Facebook group, the successes are being shared and it's a constant, the people are staying plugged in to the, to the community and it's become almost like a tribe of like, we mm -hmm. support each other. And so somebody is like afraid and has very little money and that money is very precious to them. They get in there and they see they, they, they don't buy a course that they don't know if it's going to work or some other dude's trying to rip them off. They're, they're going to the Facebook group. They're first getting sure, seeing that, oh, my God, this actually works. I see deal after deal after deal. They reach out to the individual members that just have a deal and they're like, hey, how is this stuff? And they're like, well, this is cool. It works. Right. And, and, and now they are more motivated and they're more excited and they get the support and they get the backup. And it becomes like a, such a support system that it carries people that in other systems have failed to actual success in our system. I love that. That social proof is so huge. You need to see other people doing it to prove that it's, that it's possible. They need to see yeah. that, that it's possible. 100%. Yeah. Well, Jack, I can't thank you enough for, for joining us today and teaching our listeners a little bit about uh, the idea of flipping land. And, and uh, we'll put all the links in our show notes for this episode as well so people can find out about your coaching and learn about, more about your course. And uh, uh, I just want to say I'm a big fan of the Scorpions. All right. There we go. Yes. <laughs> the, 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 the German group that most people don't know, it's German. Yeah. But you That's do. Scorpions. Yes. Oh, I love them. So yeah. thanks so much for your time today, Jack. And uh, like I said, I'll put all the links in the show notes and everything and, uh, and uh, recommend highly everyone go check out Jack's stuff. Thank you very much for having me. Awesome.